Um, yeah, this talk, it's, uh, it's going to be split into two parts. So the first part is going to be about uh, learning closure relations for the 1D2 food model uh, using neural networks trained on 2D data. And the second part is going to be on uh, energy conservation for the two food model and deriving an energy conserving discretization for the two food model. So uh, first, let's uh, look at what the two food model is used for. So you can think of uh, the oil and gas industry, where oil and gas will be found together in underground reservoirs, and they will be piped up together. And sometimes uh, they need to be transported together over long distances. For example, when you have an offshore platform, you need to transport uh, to a processing facility. Uh, these pipelines can be many kilometers long, and you have the oil and the gas flowing together. A uh, second application is uh, in nuclear reactor safety analysis, where you can have um, pipes with water to cool a nuclear reactor. While the water evaporates, turns into steam, and you have water and the steam flowing together. And in both applications, efficiency is uh, paramount because well, when you have very long pipelines, you cannot uh, resolve these uh, all uh, exactly. And in safety analysis, well, in design, you need to have many different simulations for many different simulations and uh, you need a high certainty. So that's why we use uh, one dimensional models for efficiency. And in this two phase pipe flow, you can have uh, quite complicated flow regimes. So a few are listed here. And uh, one uh, particular flow regime which we are interested in is a uh, slug flow. So uh, you see that here. What you see is that um, intermittently the liquid will fill up the entire cross section of the pipe and uh, you have gas bubbles between uh, the liquid. And this type of flow is actually undesired. It can, cause, uh, it can cause damage to the pipe. It's also quite difficult to model. And this is an ultimate goal of my PhD project. So talking about 2D and 1D models, uh, you can compare them uh, side by side. And uh, well, if you have a high dimensional model, you are resolving more details you are generally more accurate, accurate, but if you have a 1D model, um, you are leaving out details um, for efficiency. But in this project, we were hoping to incorporate some of the knowledge from the high dimensional model in the 1D model while keeping the efficiency. So what does our 1D model look like? Well, it's a 1D model, and that means that it's a cross-sectionally average model. Uh, that means that um, all the variables are cross-sectional averages. So here, AL, it's the cross-sectional area of the lower fluid, and AU is the cross-sectional area of the upper fluid. And UL is the velocity of the lower fluid averaged over its cross-section. And UU is the velocity of the upper fluid averaged over its cross-section. And in the average, we have to make some assumptions. And uh, for example, hydrostatic balance. And we look here at the incompressible model. And in the averaging, we are also, in, also introduce closure terms, uh, which will, I will go into more detail uh, later. So we'll have a brief look at the model the equations just to uh, get a feel for them. So um, we have four equations. And two of them are related to the lower fluid, and two of them are related to the upper fluid. So these first two are just mass conservation equations for the upper and lower fluid, respectively. Uh, so here we have a mass, it's the density times cross section. It's just a mass, and we're looking at the time evolution of it. And uh, the mass is just being affected by mass infection terms, so a velocity times the mass. And uh, that's all, there's no source terms for the mass. So it's just a mass conservation equation. And the third and fourth are momentum conservation equations. Uh, so the momentum here, velocity times cross section. 
uh, time to density. And the momentum is also being affected by uh, momentum infection terms. These will look like uh, u squared times a cross section. Um, and uh, momentum is also influenced by uh, the hydrostatic uh, pressure terms. I call them the level gradient terms, and they give the, uh, the influence of a varying hydrostatic pressure or of a varying uh, interface height. And they use a general geometric notation, which is just um, looking at uh, the hydrostatic pressure. And it's, um, it's you're given in a way that it applies to arbitrary geometries. So it's an integral uh, over the cross section. But if you evaluate this for a specific cross section, so for example, for a 2D channel geometry, uh, it, it reduces just to a very simple form, which you see here uh, at the bottom. And uh, then we still have uh, some uh, pressure terms. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, source terms, which all influence the, the conservation of these uh, conservative variables, the Q. So in the source terms, we are interested in the friction terms because this is what we need closure relations for. And so we have a wall friction for both the upper and the lower fluids. These are these tau u and the tau l. They are multiplied by the perimeter over which they act. So each fluid has a certain perimeter. You saw here in which it is in contact with the boundary. And over those perimeters, those stresses act. And the fluids, they also have a stress working on each other at the interface. And of course, they are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction for the lower and upper fluid. And these are the terms that need to be closed. And uh, well, why do we need closure terms? Uh, I think that's important to understand. Well, in the 2D model, we just have a full velocity profile. So um, we can see here the velocity just varying over the vertical coordinates. It's zero at the no slip boundaries, but it has a profile between. Well, in the 1D model, we only have these averaged velocities. So we are really taking the average of these uh, profiles. But the stresses, they are defined as the slopes of these profiles at the boundaries. And uh, so in the, in the 2D model or in the 3D model, these are just uh, direct function of the solution, it's just directly available. It's there, but in the 1D model, we do not have these slopes because we do not have the profiles. And so that means we need some relation between these average variables and the stresses. And this is similar to uh, a turbulence closure problem, where if you have a full DNS just resolving everything, no averaging, you also do not need the closure terms. But if you have uh, RANs or LVS, uh, you are averaging, leaving out the small details, you also need uh, to, in some way to link the variables that you do have to the uh, turbulent stresses. So that's uh, very similar to this problem. Uh, we need a relation between the variables that we do have and the stresses uh, that we need. Okay, so this is, uh, you can say, a long-standing problem. Conventionally, it's done just uh, based on experiments and particularly steady state experiments. So just put the body force over a section of pipe. So like a pressure gradient or um, uh, gravity and uh, you uh, measure the velocities and you correlate these uh, then to the stresses using these balances. But um, as I say, this relies on the steady states only in the steady state you have these simple balances and um, that means that these closure terms may not generalize well to unsteady flow or wavy interfaces and that is what we really hope to improve upon here and um, the why do yeah the, the better way in which to understand why these closure terms cannot generalize well is um, by noting the non-unique character of the relation between the velocity profiles and the average velocities. So if you can have many different profiles which have the same average velocity, and this is possible in an, in an unsteady flow, 
where you have extra degrees of freedom and you can have time derivatives and spatial derivatives. So you can have very many different profiles given the same average velocity. Um, but you are using these average velocities to determine your stresses. Uh, that means um, that, uh, yeah, you are taking all these profiles and saying the stress is the same for all of them. But of course, it's going to be the case these profiles, they determine the stresses and they, uh, their slope, if they're very different, they will have different stresses. And so just collapsing all these into one average velocity, you are losing uh, information. So you have a uniqueness issue in your stresses. And um, we might solve this by adding uh, information to the closure relations. And this is uh, not possible conventionally, but is possible with our methods. So what is our method? Well, we conduct um, 2D simulations, a lot of them. And in these 2D simulations, we can just calculate the stresses, as I said. And uh, these stresses, they are paired up with the average velocities simulations, and this forms the training data. So this you can feed to a neural network, and the neural network will learn the relation between the average variables and the stresses. And um, well, the good thing about the neural network is uh, you don't have to assume the form of this relation. It is very flexible and it will learn a relation. And um, so we can also easily add another input. And what we are adding here compared to conventional closure terms, is this interface slope. So this is an extra piece of information which will um, relieve the uniqueness issue, which we will see later. And so once you have this network, it's relating your average variables to your stresses. And so these um, can be used as your closure terms in your 1D model. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. All right, so um, we need training data. Well, uh, this is just an example. This is just 2D simulations of a wave uh, damping. In one case, we start from a zero velocity profile. In the other case, we start from a developed velocity profile. Mm -hmm. And um, at each time instant, you can calculate stresses and the average variables. And these uh, form your data points. And we conduct very many simulations like this uh, with the different uh, initial parameters. And then we feed this data to a neural network. And uh, as you know, there are many different neural networks and it would just use a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron or feed-forward network. And the hyperparameters we tune using steady-state data because it's easily available. And these lead us to an optimal choice of four hidden layers, uh, 18 nodes, and uh, hyperbolic tangent activation function. We use a uh, Leeuwenberg marker training, which is uh, um, good. It's robust and quick for the small network. We need to normalize the data and importantly, we add noise to the training data and this uh, prevents overfitting. And we also uh, apply bagging, which means we are averaging the results of multiple networks to get a more uh, stable prediction. The networks turn on different subsets of the data, different initializations. Uh, yeah, gives you more robust prediction. Okay, so the first question is, can our network um, approximate the data? And uh, well, of course it should be able to. So here we just have a neural network trained on steady data, testing it on steady data. And um, what you see in the graph is on the horizontal axis, what the data predicts on the vertical axis, what the network predicts. And the R squared is the correlation coefficient and one is the maximum value. So we have here perfect um, agreement. And of course, the network should be able to do this. This is just a basic uh, sanity check. The interesting, more interesting thing is when you test this network trained on steady data, test it on uh, uh, unsteady data. What you see here, well, this is a very bad uh, correlation, not good. Um, so this really tells us that um, 
Well, this is also this is what these conventional closure terms are doing, right? So they are based on steady data, and you apply them to unsteady data. Um, you will get the same results if you use just conventional closure terms instead of the network train on the same data. It really tells you that you really need to take uh, these uh, unsteady data into account when uh, creating closure terms for unsteady simulations. So that's what we do. We train the network on the unsteady data. And we see already that the correlation is much improved. Uh, still not as good as we would uh, like it to be. So we have a value of 0 0.7 here. We want to get closer to 1. So we add our extra inputs, which I talked about earlier. We add the interface slope as an input, relieving the uniqueness issue, uh, giving the network more information to distinguish between uh, different um, unsteady uh, profiles. And uh, this really improves the correlation by quite a lot. We are at 0 0.97, almost 1. So that's very good. And this tells us that our network is uh, capable of approximating the stresses in unsteady simulations. And um, it was necessary to train on unsteady data and use extra inputs. So that's a very uh, interesting, good result. But the real test is, of course, to apply this now to a, a simulation, so to apply it to a 1D model. So let's do that. Uh, here we will see in black, we will see our 2D model, so our, I say, a ground truth. And in blue, we will see our 1D model with the closure terms. So we want the blue line to match the black line as well as possible. And uh, here we compare two, uh, two situations. On the left, we use the conventional closure terms for the blue model, for the 1D model. And on the right, we use our new neural network closure terms uh, for, the, for the blue model. So let's look at it. Uh, yeah, here we see a wave uh, damping. And we can see in both cases, the blue line does not really match the black line, right? But what we do see is that on the right, um, the damping behavior seems to be captured uh, quite well by the blue line, even though the wave seems to be out of phase. That seems to be the main difference. Well, on the left, we see that the, um, the blue line is not damping well at all. It's, uh, it's forming uh, spurious oscillations and um, somewhat of a sharp, uh, sharp jump. So uh, it's not damping. Um, it's not damping like the black line. And so we can conclude that even though on the right hand side the waves are out of phase, the, damp the damping behavior is much improved on the right hand side. So with our new neural network closure terms. So this might still be a little bit difficult to see here. So what we can also do is look at uh, the local interface height at one point, plot it in time. And again, we compare on the left the conventional closure terms, and on the right our new neural network closure terms. Again, the black line is a 2D model, the blue line is our 1D model. And uh, well, on the right, we can clearly see that the damping behavior is much better uh, captured even though you can see the waves coming out of phase. On the left, the, the blue line stops damping. Even at some point, it starts growing again. So um, this, on the right-hand side, we really see a marked uh, improvement. And that these waves are out of phase, it's, um, it's understandable. Because if you look at a theoretical analysis of a linear, as a linear stability analysis of the models, and you disregard completely the friction terms, even then you will see this difference that in the 1D model, the wave speed is higher, particularly for small wavelengths. So this is really um, uh, a difference between the models which is not associated with friction. 
uh, yeah, so we won't be able to fix it with the friction. But the friction terms did already improve the matching a little bit. So as an intermediate conclusion, we are uh, happy with these new uh, friction terms, which really give um, better results in unsteady simulations. And it was because they allowed uh, us to easily add another input, the interface slope, which will lead to the uniqueness issue in the closure relations. And while well, there remain differences between the 1D and 2D model that uh, are not um, fixable by improving the closure terms. Um, and related to that is this issue with the two fluid model. So again, if you look at the linear stability analysis of the two fluid model, another uh, theoretical result you will see is that for some flow configurations, um, you will get an unbounded growth rate for small perturbations. And uh, we call this uh, ill-posed, the model is ill-posed um, conditionally, so for these flow configurations. And uh, this is very bad because it means in the numerical simulation, if you refine uh, your grid, you will be refining the smaller wavelengths. And so you're getting an increased uh, growth rate. And so the simulations will not uh, converge. And uh, well, of course, uh, you want a simulation to, uh, to be consistent. So this is bad. And um, so this is yeah, a second um, aspect of the two food model that we are now looking to tackle after improving the friction terms. So to try to see if we can do something about this uh, issue. And we're going to do that by uh, looking at energy conservation for the TFM, because um, we think it is important to um, have a, a nonlinear view of the TFM instead of just a linear view. And uh, the energy provides this. It's, uh, it's a, an aspect of the full nonlinear TFM. Um, so we're going to, uh, to derive that and uh, derive an energy conserving discretization for the TFM and see if eventually if this could make the model um, well posed in a, in a non-linear sense instead of uh, linearly. And um, so this is not coming completely out of the blue. This, uh, this structure is also um, is present in, uh, in other uh, equations. So if you think about the Navier-Stokes equations and the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, uh, you just have momentum conservation equations and an equation for incompressibility, right? And, um, but even in those uh, Navier-Stokes equations, there's an underlying conserved quantity, uh, the kinetic energy. There's not an explicit equation for it, but you can derive from those equations, from momentum and the incompressibility equation, that the kinetic energy is conserved. And uh, this is a result uh, of some structure in equations being skew symmetry of the convection operator and the gradient and the virgins operators being a joint. And uh, if you preserve this structure in a, in a discretization, you can also preserve the discrete kinetic energy. And um, for the Navier-Stokes equations, this energy is a normal solution and conserving it can make the Navier-Stokes equations uh, nonlinearly stable. And so this is something we would like to achieve also for the two food model. Okay, so what am I talking about exactly when I'm talking about energy conservation? Well, I'm uh, talking about mainly uh, conservation of the global energy, which you call E, meaning that it is, uh, meaning that uh, the EVT is here. And I define the global energy in relation to the local energy. And uh, the, local, um, the local energy, it um, will also be conserved uh, locally. So it will satisfy a conservation equation, meaning that um, energy cannot be produced and there's no sinks. It can just flow in or out of a certain uh, domain. Um, so it's conserved globally. If you integrate this local energy conservation equation of the main and you have periodic or close boundaries, you will find that uh, no energy flows in or out, and you have uh, this global conservation equation. 
So we want to find, this is our goal, right? We want to find this local energy conservation equation and this will lead then to global energy conservation. And we want to derive this local energy conservation equation from the model equations. So in the model, we just have mass and momentum conservation equations, but uh, we want to derive from that, that implicitly the energy should be conserved. Okay, so the way in which we do that is we take the model, you can see it here again, I showed you uh, this model at the beginning of the presentation, the, Q, the QDT plus DDS of F plus D times uh, the PDS, I use uh, source terms, I leave out the source terms here. And I take the inner products of the model with a vector called V, which is just um, composed of the derivatives of the E of the energy to the conservative variables. So just start with the model, take the end product with uh, something. You will find here that the first uh, term equals the EDT. So this is already looking like the first term in this local energy conservation equation. And for the rest of the terms to also um, transform into this local energy conservation equation, we need uh, for the flux terms, we need this, we need this these flux terms to, um, to be ds ds of h. For the pressure terms, we need to be the d ds of uh, j. And so then uh, we will find back this local energy conservation equation. And the problem is now to find this uh, combination of e, h, and j, such that indeed uh, these conditions are satisfied. So we need to... Um, to, uh, to take an energy. And this is uh, just based on physical considerations. So here, the first term, if you look at this, it's really just um, center of mass of the lower fluid. This is the center of mass of the upper fluid. And multiplying that by density and uh, gravity will give you potential energy. And the third and fourth terms are just, um, if you fill in what these conservative variables are, you will get to velocity squared times the cross section. And so they're kinetic energies. And again, here we have these general geometric terms, which you can evaluate for specific geometries. And uh, so for the challenge geometry, it's just a simple relation to the cross section, a half times uh, cross section squared. All right. So with this energy, uh, you can look at the condition on the pressure terms. And uh, what you will find is that uh, this condition is satisfied if you take J is QP, with Q being the volumetric flow rate. And this uh, relies on the volumetric flow constraints. So our equations are incompressible. So uh, we cannot uh, have... Um, volume uh, being created, we must have this uh, DDS of Q being zero. And this is very much like, uh, yeah, like the divergence of the velocity being zero in the Navier-Stokes equations. And there it's also necessary for energy conservation. And um, so with this volumetric flow constraint, Q being constant, we have um, that the uh, Pressure terms are energy conserving if you take J as QP. That's very good. For the effective terms, we look at the condition uh, on the effective terms. We were formulated a little bit into a new quantity called the entropy potential. It's related to the energy flux H. And it turns out, um, with a little trial and error, looking at other models and physical considerations, that uh, this condition is satisfied if you take this for the entropy potential, and this leads to an energy flux given here at the bottom. And uh, this is great. So now we have found an E, H, and J, which uh, satisfy these conditions. And so we have obtained uh, this local energy conservation equation from the basic momentum uh, equations. And as a side note, this relies on some geometric relations uh, relating the uh, level gradient terms in the model 
So the uh, so it's relating to the variation in the interface height, relating them to uh, the interface heights uh, themselves, and um, just uh, these are satisfied. And just to keep this in mind uh, for a bit later, because now we're going to look at the discrete model. So uh, the discrete model, um, we look at the semi-discrete model. So it means we discretize in space, but not uh, yet in time. Uh, because we are interested in uh, spatial energy conservation. So uh, we use a staggered grid. That means that the pressure and also Q1 and Q2, so the masses, they are defined at the pressure cells. And the uh, uh, momenta, meaning Q3 and Q4, they are defined at the velocity cells. And the velocity cells are shifted by half a grid cell uh, with respect to the pressure cells. And uh, this is very good for the coupling between the uh, pressure and the velocities. And it's uh, yeah, a standard choice uh, for this model. And uh, we use a finite uh, volume scheme, which is uh, very nice because it uh, gives us mass and momentum conservation. So we just have flux flowing in and out. And we have still the non-conservative pressure terms. And so here in this discrete vector of variables, you can see here Q1 and Q2 being defined at grid points I, so the pressure cells, and Q3 and Q4 being defined at grid points uh, I minus a half, so the velocity cells. And similarly for the uh, fluxes. And so just very much like in the continuous case, we want to prove conservation of global energy. So, um, that means the EVT is zero. But now the global energy will be related to the lo local energy, not via integral over the domain, but via a sum over the domain. And again, we have a local energy conservation equation. Uh, but now instead of uh, a DDS, we have a, a difference between two grid cells. Uh, for the rest, it's uh, very much the same. Uh, again, this is just a conservation equation for the local energy. So energy can flow in and out, it cannot be produced or destroyed. And again, if you integrate this over the domain, you get uh, the global energy conservation. Or instead of integrating, take the sum. Okay, small side note for notation. We're going to use from now on these uh, double brackets for jumps. So a difference between one grid cell and the next and an overline for an interpolation. So just averaging only two good cells. And uh, this can be done for the pressure cells, I, or also for the velocity cells, uh, I minus half. All right, so very much like in the continuous case, we're going to uh, start with our discrete model again. And we're going to take the inner product with uh, the V vector. And the V vector is again, the derivative of the energy to the conservative variables. The difference is in this case, we have um, the energy depending on two sets of conservative variables. Those are the, the variables at point i minus one and the variables at point uh, i. And that's because uh, with the staggered grid, the variables are defined at different points. And so when you um, define an energy, you need to interpolate uh, between the two grids. And you will get the dependence on the variables at multiple uh, grid points. And so we need to take this into account. And so we take the model, the discrete model at point i, and the discrete model at point i minus one, take in the products with the v vectors and uh, sum the two. So we need to take those two points. So that makes it a bit more complicated for the staggered grid. And this makes it, um, yeah, this makes this uh, derivation uh, so novel compared to literature where uh, collocated grids uh, are used, for example, for the uh, shadow other equations and um, but it is uh, it is doable because again these uh, these time derivative terms will give you the time derivative of the local energy so again already starting to look like an energy conservation equation and again we can define the conditions on the, on the flux terms so we need the flux terms to look like a jump in h 
um, where a jump in H is just, uh, it's just this, right? HI minus HI minus one. We want to get these terms back in the local energy conservation equation. So that's just what it's written here on the right hand side. And uh, it's the same for the pressure terms. The pressure terms need to look like a jump in J. So the difference between Ji and J minus one. And again, we need to find the combination of E, H, and J such that these conditions are satisfied. Uh, so again, we define an energy and we can base this now just directly on the continuous energy. We need to interpolate uh, a little bit and uh, we need to make a bit of a choice in how we define it. And we define it here at the velocity grid points. And uh, this is an advantageous choice, which will yield um, the pressure terms naturally um, being uh, energy conserving and uh, also lead to um, good uh, yeah, mass, um, mass fluxes, which are well coupled. And um, so other choices are maybe possible for the energy, but we have found uh, mainly, mainly related to different interpolation, right, or different grid, finding it at the pressure points instead of the velocity points. But we have found that, these, uh, that this definition is, um, yeah, really makes uh, the derivations natural and gives uh, nice fluxes. And it's, um, it's a natural extension of the continuous energy. So we can look with this energy at the condition on the pressure terms. And we will find again that if we apply the volumetric flow constraints, uh, that indeed the condition on the, on the pressure terms is satisfied with J being uh, the volumetric flow rate times the pressure, just like uh, in the continuous case. So that is um, yeah, really excellent and uh, yeah, a nice result of this, um, this energy and uh, these conditions. Um, then, so we go to the flux terms. We look at that condition. We again, we formulate it like in the continuous case to, um, to be depending on an entropy potential, psi instead of the H. It's again related to H. And uh, we can base this entropy potential psi on the continuous equivalent with some interpolation. But now the problem is to find, so this condition kind of turns into a condition on the fluxes instead of psi, because we know psi is this, but we want to know what the conservative numerical fluxes are now, which conserve our energy. So this is a little different from the continuous case. Uh, but we can, uh, we can fill in the condition. We need to make a few assumptions. We will uh, assume that the fluxes are depending, the fluxes for the upper fluid are depending only on the variables of the upper fluid. Fluxes of the lower fluid are depending only on the variables of the lower fluid. And we will assume that the fluxes can be split into an advective term and a level gradient term. And um, we will assume, we will um, choose the mass Infection fluxes to be defined as such because uh, these do not require interpolation and this is an advantageous form which is good for the coupling between the Q1 and the Q3 and the Q2 and the Q4. So we choose that and with these uh, minor assumptions we can obtain the remaining numerical fluxes. So we obtain the effective numerical fluxes um, and they are uh, Great, they are directly comparable to the continuous numerical fluxes and uh, they work uh, great. For the um, level gradient uh, numerical fluxes, they're a bit complicated because you see here a term in front, which is essentially the same as the continuous flux, but plus an extra term. And this extra term is a bit nasty because you are dividing by something that can be zero. And uh, as we know, that's uh, not fun to do in the numerical setting. So um, we need to look a bit closer. So if we go back to those conditions that I mentioned for the, uh, those geometric conditions that I mentioned for the continuous case, you had um, a DDS of the uh, H hats and a DDS of the H on the right hand side. And we can find exactly analogous conditions for the discrete case, right? So with the brackets, 
So here we have a jump instead of a DDS. Um, this, this jump is just a disc discrete equivalent of the DDS. And so we have very analogous conditions. And if these conditions are satisfied also in the discrete case, not only in the continuous case, then uh, the second terms here, these factors they disappear and we are left with just with this nice, really nice form. Now in the general case, these conditions are not exactly satisfied discreetly. They are only satisfied approximately in the discrete case for arbitrary geometries. But if we now look at a very specific uh, geometry, say the, the 2D channel geometry, then um, for this geometry, these conditions are actually exactly satisfied. So this is very good. So for this geometry, we can indeed say that the numerical factors are given by this, and these, uh, these work fine numerically. So that is uh, really good. We have a, a nice set of fluxes now. So now we can test them. We go to the results. Uh, yeah, we implement these fluxes in our, in our 1D model. And what we see here on the top left, you can see the interface height and we see a Gaussian perturbation spreading out into two waves. It's going to be reflected at the boundaries and come back. And uh, then it's going to uh, split up again. And um, we can see with this uh, movement happening, we can see that the kinetic and potential energy are going to vary. We can see that's in the bottom right. So we see um, that over time, the potential energy is going to change and the kinetic energy is going to change. But you can see the movement is perfectly symmetric. So they're, they're balancing out. So together, uh, the total energy is being conserved. And uh, that you can see also in the top right plot here, where we have a scale of 10 to the minus 13. And this shows our relative total energy relative to the starting energy. And uh, so you can see that the energy is really, um, really staying quite constant here on the scale of our solution. This is about uh, machine precision. So that's, uh, that's a great result. And um, I should note here that here we are using a very fine time step because we only looked at spatial uh, conservation and the scheme is not yet exactly uh, temporally conserving the energy. So we need a fine time step. And you can see that if you were fine with the time step, that uh, indeed the error is depending on the size of the time step and the error is actually converging uh, with the order of the time integration scheme, which is fourth order. So we can see uh, that we only have a temporal error indeed, and uh, we really have no spatial error uh, at all. So that's, uh, that's great, our results are confirmed. Uh, so then we can conclude that we have found that so for our 1D uh, two food model, we have found mm -hmm that the energy is an uh, underlying uh, conserved quantity. Uh, it can be derived just from the mass and momentum conservation equations. And um, it's, uh, our approach is uh, general, it's general for different geometries, right? We use a general uh, geometric uh, uh, form. And um, we then uh, adapted our, this, uh, our derivation to have discrete parallels to all the continuous uh, conditions. So we have a discrete uh, derivation running parallel to the continuous derivation, but with uh, discrete jumps instead of uh, derivatives to the horizontal coordinates. And uh, this allowed us to find the miracle fluxes, which are spatially energy conserving. And we are excited about this because um, we are going to investigate in the future if with this conservation of energy, um, possibly adding some dissipation, we can make the TFM um, well posed in a, in a non-linear sense. So as opposed to just looking at the linear stability analysis. And um, this result is, uh, I think, more broadly um, um, 
of importance. So we looked here at a, um, a structure preserving discretization and a metrified de derivation is, uh, is more broadly applicable than just to the two food model. And uh, I think it's uh, important for more models to uh, look at the underlying physical structure and uh, try to preserve it. And uh, this cannot only be done with the discretization, you can also think about if you are trying to replicate um, a model with a neural network, you can also think about preserving this structure. So yeah, you can see here we have a structure preserving discretization, you might also have a structure preserving uh, neural network and um, you can use this to conserve uh, this energy and make, uh, make it more physical. So uh, for example, uh, work has been done with uh, neural networks learning the Hamiltonian of a physical system and then just deriving dynamics from the learned Hamiltonian. And this ensures that your physical system is energy conserving. And I think this is a way uh, to make your neural network uh, physically informed and um, yeah, improve the physical fidelity uh, of your model, like, um, like I've done for this discretization. And this is work that is going to be um, done in the future also in, the, in our group. So learning is Hamiltonian for a single phase flow setting and um, deriving dynamics from that. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would like to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Julian. Uh, anybody want to ask a question? If so, just unmute or raise your hand. And if not, I might have one in the meantime. So in the first part, you mentioned that the uh, uh, the interface slope adding as a feature helps to relieve the uniqueness issue. Yes. Could you explain that a bit more, maybe? Wasn't... Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So I said here that in a closure relation, you are relating your average variables that you have to the stresses that you have. Um, but yeah. what if those average variables are not enough? What if they do not give you enough information? What if you can have very different stresses, um, even if those average variables are the same? That's kind of what I'm trying uh, to say. Yeah. And that is the case when you have unsteady flow. You can have uh, very different profiles all evaluating to the same average velocity. And different profile means a different stress. So when you give the closure relation an extra input, so adding to this row, you're giving it um, more information. So um, you are um, constraining, say, the, the freedom, right? You are, um, so you are making, yeah. yeah, the relation, say, more, you're giving more possibility for relation to be uh, unique. So, but it doesn't completely solve it, right? It just, or... So it doesn't, maybe not completely indeed. So uh, that is also uh, a possible expansion to add even more information. So you can mm -hmm. think of adding time derivatives and um, the spatial derivatives of other variables and uh, giving it more interpolate and more information will uh, eventually um, can uh, can give a really unique uh, relation indeed if i may uh, follow up on that yes yeah. Julian, how, how did you get to this interface slope as adding sort of to adding that as extra information is, is that is there a physical reason for that was it trial and error how, how did that go um, yeah, so we were basically thinking about uh, our test case. So our test case is, uh, is, uh, is a wavy flow, right? And um, we, uh, we are thinking that um, 
the stress might vary at uh, at the at the top of a wave or in the in the in the middle uh, of a wave, because um, we are having a different uh, velocity profile there. So this is this interface float. It gives you uh, information about the about there being a wavy flow, because otherwise you would not know this at all. You would the closure relation would just think it's a flat interface, while this uh, this interface being wavy and being dynamic, um, we thought could have an important effect on the, uh, on the stresses. Okay, so that's that's a sort of physical heuristic in a, in a way. Yeah. As you relied on here. And so do you think that sort of searching for this sort of pieces of additional information that you could use is something you can do maybe in a in a systematic way, for instance, rely on data that you have? Um, yes, I guess, yeah, you could, um, you could test the sensitivity of your stresses on these different uh, inputs. Uh, when you are looking at your 2D model data, uh, indeed, that, that would be an idea. Um, for now, I only looked at this single additional uh, input um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, different inputs, uh, as I say, could also yield uh, better results. Yeah, I'm just wondering how, how, how to go about this if, you, if there's if you don't have much physical insight to, to, to go by. But of course, it's uh, um, depends very much on the, on the kind of application that you're looking at, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have maybe a question uh, about connecting the second part and the first part. So you say in the second part that energy conservation is a path towards stability. And at the same time, stable formulation of the governing equations, at the same time, you, can, you are plugging in a neural network to represent your uh, closure terms, your friction terms. And how can you guarantee stability when you have that neural network plugged in? Um, so I think so. The first part really helps to improve the, uh, the connection, uh, the, the fidelity of the, of the of the model to the to a higher dimensional model to the two D model. And the second part aims to solve an issue that is not fixable by improving the closure terms. Uh, so the opposing issue, the difference in the dispersion relations, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so about uh, uh, stability. Yeah, so the stability issue, the main issue is not with the uh, is not with the friction uh, terms. With the friction terms, it, um, there is an unstable regime that is not opposed when you have these uh, friction terms, but it's not. Uh, it's not catastrophic. It's uh, it's an uh, okay uh, instability. It's a physical instability. So I think these are not um, the main issue. Um, of course, if you have very uh, odd closure relations, it might um, might give issues. But we have taken care to um, yeah to use uh, bagging, as I say, on the networks to uh, obtain. Uh, somewhat to robust uh, predictions, which um, should not, uh, yeah, go completely out of the park. Um, so I think, I think um, that kind of mitigates it and uh, so it's not something uh, we really observed uh, severe instability. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with what you say, but um, that there are two separate things, the ill postness and uh, closure problem. But still, if you do, so if you have a, a fixed uh, the ill postness issue and you would have a stable scheme, then plugging in an, a source term, which is a neural network, I think could destroy uh, stability uh, in the sense that for some state that has been unseen before in the training of your neural network, uh, you might get uh, large deviations in your source term that lead to unphysical results. Yeah, that, that's certainly uh, there will always uh, 
being issued going outside the training data. I do not uh, recommend that with these um, the neural network I have now. Um, if these, as I have them, they do not extrapolate well. They uh, we should really use them only for training. Yeah, inside the training data, say. Um, you could think about um, um, building also some more structure, maybe into the neural networks that will might make it more um, extrapolating. Um, if if you would want them to extrapolate. Yeah, but apart from extrapolative capabilities, would it be possible to build in the neural network some type of structure that you know that um, that it uh, dissipates energy? Because that's what you would like to have from your uh, from your yeah. friction terms. So. Yeah, that is. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe the. I think it's the. Turbulent flow probably is. I've seen also people with Rams models that uh, when you plug in a neural network to represent a closure term, that uh, it sometimes just explodes or it becomes unstable. So I think this is a bit of a, an open issue also in other fields. Uh, yeah. Yeah, certainly uh, important issue. Yeah, the sort of relations that the conventional relations that there are, they are not really. Um, yeah. Uh, very physical relations, more just uh, correlations, but um, but still constraining it more to uh, be, be disputed. That's that's a good idea. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, Any final questions, perhaps? And. Um, if not, uh, we're almost uh, through the hour. So uh, thank you, Julian. I, I like your talk. It was quite interesting. Thank and you. Uh, thank you all for attending. Hope to see you again in two weeks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, bye-bye. present for you in the Slack. <laughs> See you in the update meeting, maybe. Yes, see you.